Hey everybody, I'm just gonna wait a minute to get started as everyone's joining from the waiting room. Hey, 71 people on the line already. That's great. So I'll get us started here. Um, welcome everybody to our first webinar in our new Macy series. It's called 10 Things You Need to Know About Equity for Children with Disabilities in Manitoba. My name is Jessica Vitello Urbanski, and I'm the manager of public education here at Macy, um, also known as the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth. Um, my pronouns are she and her. Macy is an independent office of the Manitoba Legislative Assembly, and we're responsible for advocating for and representing children, youth, and young adults in the province. Part of our mandate is to conduct research to improve services in Manitoba and to educate the public about children's rights. I just want to let you know we're going to be recording today so that we can replay this webinar later on our YouTube channel. And before we begin, I'd like to ask Cheryl Alexander, uh, the knowledge keeper here at Macy, to start us off in a good way with a prayer. Good afternoon. Miigwech ni mashumas ojibo wase aziang. Miigwech nakit nom gom gizigad. Wewene jimeno gana wabamang. Ni we jimeno pamatis minawa wewene ji gaganunga. Miigwech ka ish kashka amekwe. Oji Miziang, Bamata Ziowin, Minawa Majim. Oji Miziang, Nabish, Minawa, Wisiag. Oji Miziang, Nisawin. Sema, Nabagadina, Wabamong. Jawanong, Eshpamok, Minawa, Gewitanong. Nada Moshin, G. Makashka, Gabi Wian, Minawa, G. Zungadean, Miigwitch. Thank you, Cheryl. So as we're moving on to the second slide here, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the mandate of our office extends, extends across the province that's now called Manitoba. And as an office, we live and work on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the beautiful homeland of the Métis Nation. We strive every day to dedicate ourselves in the public resources we are given to make meaningful contributions to the lives of all children and youth, and especially the lives and experiences of First Nations and Métis youth in our province. We do this by listening to the voices and opinions of Indigenous young people in our work, by ensuring our staff team reflects the diversity of the families we serve, consulting with community members outside of our office, working in collaboration with the diversity of Indigenous peoples in Manitoba, and overall ensuring our office embraces a philosophy of continual learning and growing in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So before we dive into the webinar today, we just wanna make sure everyone's Zoom functions are working properly. And we'd like to start off with a couple of quick and easy poll questions to ask about your role in the community and how you heard about the webinar today. So I'm gonna launch the poll here. And we'll give everyone a minute to respond. As we're doing this poll question too, um, it'd be great if we could learn a little bit more about who's attending today. Do you feel comfortable sharing in the chat box your name and pronouns, your location, and your role or position in the community? Um, we also have an ASL interpreter here with us today and the option to turn on closed captions if you need. Um, and if you're having any other accessibility needs or technical issues, feel free to DM myself or Narpindra Rahalu, who's one of our staff um, who's helping host this webinar. And we'll try to help get those things sorted. Thanks to everyone introducing themselves in the chat there. I'll just wait one more minute for the questions. Okay, so 
looks like most people have answered, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Um, so 79% of the folks here today are service providers, uh, followed by 18% who are from the other category, and 3% are public officials. We have 68% of people joining um, who heard about this webinar through work, so that's great. Good spreading of the word. And 24% through email, 6% through social media, and 3% through word of mouth. So thank you everyone for joining um, from wherever you heard about us. Um, I'm going to pass things over now to, uh, to Macy's staff right away. I just want to remind everyone that we're going to have an evaluation at the end of the webinar, um, which will be sent out shortly after the fact. So for everyone who fills out the evaluation, we're going to be sending a <coughs> certificate of completion. Um, once you filled out that evaluation, so please do so. It helps us improve the webinars for future audiences. So I'm going to pass things over now to two other Macy staff who were our co-lead researcher and investigator for the report we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Charlene Muzeka is a researcher at Macy and Whitney Moore is an investigator. So take it away, you two. Thank you, Jessica. Today we are presenting information from Bridging the Gaps, Achieving Substantive Equality for Children with Disabilities in Manitoba, a special report published in March 2021. As with most of our special reports, this report is grounded in the story of a child. In our special report, we introduce you to a child we call Emma. This is not her real name. We are concealing the name in order to protect her and her family's privacy. The advocate was notified of the death of a child we refer to as Emma in 2017. Emma's family struggled to navigate disability services for children in Manitoba and ultimately relied on child and family services for support. Emma died accidentally just days before an emergency systems meeting was scheduled to discuss an out of home placement for her. The investigation into the public services Emma and her family received uncovered some important systemic issues. To understand the extent and the nature of the barriers Emma's families faced, the report integrated the investigation with findings from a survey of caregivers of children and youth with disabilities, interviews with academic experts, current and former providers, families, and children and youth with disabilities, and data analysis of children's disability services and child and family services records. In all, over 400 people participated in the making of the report. This special report marks the first time that our independent office has reviewed the disability system for children in our province. Our investigation and special report found a system that reflects a family-centered philosophy, but we also found significant gaps in the services available to children with disabilities and their families in Manitoba, which present challenges in the realization of children's rights. Today, we've identified 10 key things you need to know about Manitoba's disability services system for children. We'll also touch on the recommendations included in the special report that we put out in March, which are intended to bridge the gaps experienced by families and move towards achieving substantive equality for children and youth with disabilities in Manitoba. Next slide. The first thing we need to highlight and emphasize today is that children with disabilities have rights. These rights are articulated in international treaties and include the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, also known as the UNCRC, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, also known as the CRPD, and finally those rights are also enshrined in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. As a signatory to these international treaties, the government of Canada and of Manitoba have assumed the obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill these rights. It means that governments have obligations to children with disabilities. There are three specific articles I'll highlight today that outline some of the entitlements of children with disabilities. Under Article 23 of the UNCRC, children with Children with disabilities have the right to a full and decent life, dignity, self-reliance, and participation. Under Article 23 of the CRPD, children have the right not to be separated from families due to a disability, and if needed, 
the right to alternative, alternative care in a family setting. Under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, children have the right to non-discrimination and substantive equality. Substantive equality mean, is also known as equity, is a legal principle that recognizes that people are born into social, physical, and cultural contexts where even if they are given the same resources equally, they will not have equal outcomes. While equality focuses on treating everyone the same, equity or substantive equality recognizes that some people, including children with disabilities, require additional resources to realize their rights. For example, children with physical disabilities might require wheelchairs to move and special transportation to fill their right to an education. Ultimately, substantive equality requires that we redress disadvantage, address stigma, enhance participation, and accommodate differences. We want to keep this uh, webinar uh, engaged, and we're just going to do a little pop-up polling question for you here. If you could answer on your screen, what is substantive equality? We'll give you a minute to answer before we show you uh, everyone's results. <laughs> Pinder, if we can see the results here. Um, so the correct answer is actually the right of children with disabilities um, to equality and outcomes. When talking about children's rights, we also want to highlight Jordan's principle. It is a legal obligation of the Government of Canada to uphold First Nation children's right to services that stemmed from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal's decision in the case of Jordan River Anderson. Jordan was a boy from Norway House Cree Nation who was born in 1999 with complex medical needs and stayed in the hospital for his whole short life. When Jordan was two years old, doctors said he could move to a special home for his medical needs. The federal and provincial governments, however, argued over who should pay for his home-based care. In the end, Jordan stayed in the hospital until his death at the age of five. In 2007, the House of Commons passed Jordan's principle, a child-first principle named in memory of Jordan River Anderson. This principle makes sure First Nations children can access all public services they need, taking into account substantive equality, distinct cultural needs, and historical disadvantages linked to colonization without experiencing any service denials, delays, or disruptions because of First Nation ancestry. Jordan's principle applies to all government services, including disability services. For more on Jordan's principle, we will be having a third webinar in this series, and we'd invite you to sign up for that one on October 27th as well. We'll put the registration link in the chat box. The second thing you need to know is that to fulfill the rights of children with disabilities, rapid diagnostic assessments are essential. Feedback from our caregivers um, survey and from service providers describe long wait times for diagnosis, primarily in the child development clinic. And entry into programs as the first major barrier to services in Manitoba. The Child Development Clinic is the main source of diagnoses in the province for neuro neurodevelopmental disabilities, such as autism, and receives somewhere between 1,500 and 1,600 referrals each year. However, they only have the equivalent of four and a half staff to complete assessments. This has created a severe bottleneck since eligibility for other services, including enrollment into children's disability services, often requires a diagnosis. During our research, we found over 300 children who had received a diagnosis and were eligible for services from Children's Disability Services, which is a primary provider for uh, disabilities for children and youth uh, before they attend school, uh, but they did not have a case manager assigned to them yet. We heard that wait lists for case managers to be assigned can take up to two years in some instances. Delays in diagnosis followed by delays in case assignment can work to delay and may ultimately deny access to crucial early intervention supports for children. 
To ensure children with disabilities receive the services they are entitled to, they need access to rapid diagnostic assessments. The third lesson from our report is that supports for children with disabilities need to center on the well being of the family unit. These supports must be well resourced to be effective and responsive. Our caregiver survey revealed that of the respondents who indicated their case manager, their child did have a case manager, 69% reported their case manager contacted them twice a year or less, while 28% received monthly contacts and 3% had weekly contacts. Lack of contact and communication was a common source of frustration for caregivers in our survey. We see that reflected in the summary statistics. Satisfaction with case management services was low with about 45% of parents saying their case management services met their needs and 52% finding their case manager helpful. I wanna be clear, however, that families generally spoke very positively about their CDS workers. They told us about the hard work and dedication of CDS case managers, but they also noted having little time with them and that their assigned workers were clearly overworked. As one caregiver survey respondent told us, quote, our CDS worker is a very nice person and we like her, but she is overworked. We only have contact with her when there is a serious problem and years go by when we don't have contact with her. It would be good to have at least an annual or semi-annual meeting with her, but we get the impression she is overworked, end quote. Our examination confirmed that CDS works within a family-centered model, which is best practice and should be commended. They also promote a philosophy that views the child and family as experts and use an approach of, of, of least intrusion into the family. These are important frameworks towards best care, but in order to implement an effective family-centered model, case managers need the time to engage with children and their families, build relationships, create assessments and plans, and contact families regularly. Parents and key informant interviewees noted that they liked their case managers, but that CDS seems severely under-resourced and staffed to provide services families require. This was confirmed by the data provided to us by CDS, which indicated the average caseload per employee is 133 children, with a range between two and up to 490 cases being managed by a single worker. There is not a large evidence base to point us to the right caseload size to inform services for children with disabilities. However, a review of best practices for high-risk children, including children with disabilities, suggests caseload sizes of 20 to 30 cases uh, for a caseworker with low-intensity cases, 10 to 20 cases for moderate intensity, and 5 to 10 cases for highly intensive services. This information is from an international best practice literature review that examined a wide range of service systems and jurisdictions around the globe. Family-centered care requires the development of relationships with families and children, which is not sustainable with high caseloads. The importance of relationships was highlighted in every interview we held with children and youth. Children with disabilities told us they wanted to have a relationship with their service providers and to be seen and heard throughout their care. This is their right as outlined in the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. They are entitled to be involved in decisions that affect them. Building relationships takes time and resources, but it is one of the most essential pieces of family-centered care. We're moving into our next poll question here which is what is the recommended caseload range for children requiring highly intensive supports? You've got a few options there. We'll give a few minutes and then we'll have Narpinder pull up the results. Okay, Narpinder, what are the results? Yeah, so most people got it right. For, for highly intensive services, uh, the recommended caseload is five to 10 cases per caseworker. The fourth fact you need to know is that there have been a significant reduction in the proportion of families receiving respite in Manitoba through children's disability services. In fact, a lower proportion of families are receiving respite today than they were five years ago. 
respite was the number one issue raised by caregivers in our survey. Respite is a very important support on which many families rely. Substantive equality, the principle that I mentioned prior um, in Canadian law in this context, recognizes that to achieve equitable outcomes, some individuals and families require more supports than others, including respite. Respite keeps families together, reduces the likelihood of maltreatment, improves behavior in children, and creates a better family environment due to reduced stress and improved coping. This graph above on the screen shows the proportion of children in children's disability services that received respite over time. We clearly see that there has been a reduction in the proportion of families receiving respite in the last five fiscal years. We see this funding pressure in the overall program budget. Caregivers also describe challenges associated with how respite was allocated and administered. Self-administered respite services, which require that parents hire, supervise, and schedule respite staff was raised as a concern for many caregivers in our survey. Self-administered respite is the approach currently favored by the province and children's disability services. Though there are three respite options um, available to parents. Self-administered respite involves families seeking out and paying their own respite workers, then being reimbursed by the province later. This requ the requirement for background safety checks, including child abuse and other prior contact checks, are also liabilities solely assumed by the family. Here are two quotes from people regarding their experiences with current respite practices. The first is from a caregiver uh, who responded to our survey. I quote, respite is to help families out and me having to do self-managed care is not a help. It only adds more work for the families. The second quote is from a service provider who was interviewed. The service provider told us, I quote, a number of things like self-administered respite were being pushed as labor-saving initiatives. Responses to an ever-shrinking workforce. I know it's difficult, but our job is to serve. What are we doing? Putting liability and work on parents is taking shortcuts that puts families, the programs, and kids at risk. No, we shouldn't be doing that. Self-administered respite can be a good option for some families, however, if they have the time, expertise, and skills to do it. However, if it were truly a family-centered care and the principle of substantive equity, um, it would require offering multiple options and helping coach families to select the right option for them and their circumstances. The next thing you should know is that few options for out-of-home alternative care exist in Manitoba for children with disabilities. Alternative care refers to care that is partially or fully undertaken by caregivers outside the home. Uh, when they are part-time, alternative care arrangements are also referred to as out-of-home respite. Out-of-home respite can be an important service for families who care for children who have significant medical, behavioral, and or sleep-related needs. Children with disabilities are best cared for within their family. All families can benefit from breaks caring for their child. This may be especially true for families who have children with disabilities who require specialized care and support. Respite support services are important services that allow parents to take a break, assist children with disabilities to make developmental gains, relieve family stress, and maintain a healthy family environment. In some cases, however, remaining in the family home full-time is no longer tenable. Article 23.5 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities provides the following guidance. State parties shall, where the immediate family is unable to care for a child with disabilities, undertake every effort to provide alternative care within the wider family, and failing that, within the community in a family setting. In Manitoba, the options for families are limited. St. Amant River Road Place, an out-of-home placement, has just 20 spots for non-ambulant or non-mobile high-medical needs, high needs children and youth. 
overnight respite needs to be booked at least six months in advance. St. Amant River Road Place is an excellent care facility. However, it does not have any dedicated crisis stabilization beds for children and youth under 18 years old. Because of a lack of community placements, crisis stabiliza stabilization beds often become long-term alternative care units. There are currently 26 spaces that are CFS managed agency resources for children who may be eligible for community living disability services. CFS authorities and agencies may have some of their own placements that are specialized or no experienced foster parents. Every single service provider we spoke to identified the need for out of home overnight respite as a major gap in the system. If we look at the continuum of alternative care seen on the screen, we note that the lack of alternative care placements in the middle of the continuum may lead some families towards full-time alternative care through child welfare, even if other options could have met their needs. Another issue is that out-of-home respite for children can't be managed by CDS right now due to legal limitations. Only CFS and CLDS can license placements in Manitoba right now. Given CDS's expertise in disability care, but lack of a mandate to license out-of-home placements, key informants interviewed said that out-of-home alternative care placements were often difficult to find or create. Many families are already in crisis by the time CDS approaches CFS to plan for the family. In order to access CFS placements, caregivers are sometimes encouraged to place their children in care of child and family services, even when there are no protection concerns. Here are a few things that service providers told us directly about this. First, one service provider said, quote, people shouldn't have to sign a VPA to live with an alternative care provider one or two weekends a month. We need to have policy change to make sure homes are safe and that families could access them. The policy got in the way, end quote. This sentiment was echoed in another interview with a service provider who said, quote, a lot of the challenges are systemic things that are fixed in place that we cannot change. If we have the ability to license a home for overnight care for disability specific children, that would be a game changer, end quote. We've got another question um, here for you guys to answer. What is a major gap in the children's disability services system? I'll give you a minute or two to answer. Carpenter, if you could share the results, please. That's right. Um, there was unfortunately no wrong answer. It was um, all of the above there um, are gaps that we found in the system. The sixth thing you need to know is that more than one in four children enrolled in children's disability services had contact with the child welfare system. In order to understand the overlap between the Children's Disabilities, CDS, and Child and Family Services, CFS systems, we link their databases. We found that on average, over the last five fiscal years, 47% of children enrolled in Children's Disability Services had at least one contact with Child and Family Services at some point in their lives. Reasons for contact with child and family services varied widely, um, but there were a few there were numerous examples of families calling child and family services for help with disability related concerns, like requesting respite because they were burnt out. This indicates that some families reach out to child and family services to advocate for children's disability services services. Of the children that were involved both with the Children's Disability Services and Child and Family Services systems, 28% had been in the care of a child welfare um, agency at some point in their lives. Um, this is more than one out of every four children. Child and Family Services is trained to address child protection concerns, but it seems from our analysis that children with disabilities and their families are sometimes relying on child and family services to address unmet disability service needs. 
This is a repeated theme in Manitoba that our office has spoken about many times over the years. Specifically, we continue to see that other child serving systems do not have the resources nor the capabilities to adequately meet all of the needs that children who rely on those systems have. And in many of those cases, child and family services is left to fill in those gaps. We have seen this pattern with children's mental health and addictions care in early childhood development, and here once again in Manitoba's children's disability system. The government needs to ensure all systems are adequately resourced and staffed so children are matched with the service providers who understand and are trained in the areas in which they need specialized supports. As a province, we can't keep on relying on child and family services to pick up the dropped pieces in other systems. We have another poll here. Uh, true or false, children entered care either directly due to their disability or disability influenced their entry into care. Um, did this happen to some of the children that we saw in our study? And everyone got it right. It was unfortunately true. The seventh fact that you need to know is that disability influenced the entry of children into the care of child and family services. When we reviewed the information, we saw that 53 children who were enrolled in children's disability services entered care during the 2019-20 fiscal year. And when I say entered into care, entered into the care of child and family services. Investigators at the Manitoba Advocate of Children and Youth, along with researchers, conducted a review of case files and we coded reasons for entry into care as being either not disability related, directly related to, to a child's disability or mixed with both reasons. The majority of children entered care for protection issues. However, 26% of children who did enter into the care of child and family services were either directly related due to their disability or their disability influenced their entry into care. Whether the child entered into care due to an explicit need for additional disability supports from child welfare or due to protection concerns, the notes on CFIS, the Child and Family Services Information System, where the Child and Family Services um, agencies keep their information, describe families in crisis. We know that children with disabilities are more likely to be victims of abuse and violence. For children who entered care directly because of their disability, service providers who were interviewed explained that CDS caps out at so much per child. Their budget can't do it. So kids are forced to follow the money and not necessarily the system that might best meet their needs. Lastly, we wanted to know if there was anything that predicted entry into the care of child and family services for children with disabilities that were enrolled in children's disability services. This was essential information to be able to identify the families that may require additional supports. We used a matched cohort design and found that single parent households, children with a primary diagnosis of developmental delay and those that had high respite needs were significantly more likely to enter into care. The eighth fact you should know is that gaps in alternative care and child welfare involvement are interrelated for families in crisis. We found that uh, each of the themes explored through this report is not separate, they are interrelated. Wait times for a diagnostic assessment are sometimes the first barriers families experience to access services. A diagnosis is a requirement to access CDS and most support services. Delays in assessments result in delays for accessing early interventions. Once at CDS, families are able to connect with the case manager and respite. 
Workers are dedicated and skilled. However, large caseloads translate to less contact with families and less proactive case planning. Further, underfunded respite services and cost-saving measures such as self-administered respite place additional burden on families. Families who can will pay out of pocket for supports or to supplement the income of respite workers, but not everyone is able to do that. When needs escalate, sometimes when the child ages or circumstances change, families often find themselves in crisis. Families with less natural support, such as single parent families, struggle even more. Many families will access alternative out-of-home care, either full-time or part-time, as a way to gain respite. However, there are gaps in alternative care options in Manitoba. Wait times can be extensive and options are scarce. This is when the child welfare system may come in. Because of their ability to license placements, they are brought in by CDS or sometimes families contact them separately. In some cases, children with disabilities enter CFS care to receive supports related to their disability and without protection concerns. These are not all of the barriers that children with disabilities and their families experience, but they are the ones we focused on for this report. We hope that together we can discuss ways to change these things for many families. Some of these issues affect children with complex and high needs, but many, including diagnostic assessments, case management, and respite, affect every child with a disability in Manitoba. The ninth fact you need to know is that services for children with disabilities are underfunded. Central to all themes in this report is that services for children with disabilities were underfunded and under-resourced. As this figure indicates, between the 2015-16 and 2019-20 fiscal years, there was a 15.5% increase in children enrolled in children's disability services. The total children disability services budget, however, only increased by 4% over the same period. Accounting for inflation, this 4% increase is actually a loss in funding. Investing early and consistent supports for children with disabilities and their families is good value for money. A cost effectiveness analysis of Ontario's Intensive Behavioral Intervention or IBI program for children with autism found that expanding the program to all autistic children in Ontario would save the government about 45 million over their lives. For the same program, eliminating wait times would increase access to early intervention and as a result, increase children's IQ, which was estimated to produce a lifetime savings of $267,000 per child. Underfunding supports for families encourage children with disabilities and specialized needs to enter the care of child and family services, which is a more expensive system. On the other hand, Resourcing children's disability system by shortening wait times, increasing respite, enhancing case management, and ensuring interventions for children with disabilities is a win-win-win for children, their families, and taxpayers. Most importantly, following these steps is aligned with fulfillment of the rights of children and youth with disabilities and government's obligation towards the care and the principle of substantive equality. Uh, the 10th and last fact you need to know is that in Manitoba, there is no legal mandate for children's disability services. While CDS has no legal mandate or standalone legislation to govern its services, child welfare, as stipulated in the Child and Family Services Act, has a mandate to provide voluntary supports to families of children living with disabilities. This legislative structure works as a pull factor towards child welfare involvement for children with disabilities that need specialized out-of-home care because child welfare is the only body legally responsible for creating specialized placement resources for children. Also, through voluntary placement agreements, the child welfare system has the ability to provide services for children with, quote, chronic medical disability requiring treatment, which cannot be provided if the child remains at home, end quote. Hence, if treatment or services for a child with disabilities cannot be provided in the home, for whatever reason, child welfare by law can be invited to have a role in the care of children with disabilities. The development of standalone legislation that provides a mandate to the Children's Disability Program 
would ensure the creation of a continuum of supports without reliance on child welfare legislation and programming, which is a system that does not have the expertise and was not designed to support the care needs and fulfill the rights of children with disabilities. The development of a distinct legislative mandate would center the rights of children with disabilities in Manitoba. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, in summary, the 10 things we hope you take away from this webinar um, are that uh, one, children with disabilities have rights. Uh, rapid diagnostic assessments are essential. Family-centered models need to be well-resourced. Um, less families are receiving respite today than five years ago. Five, there are few options for alternative care outside the child welfare system. Six, there is a large overlap between the disabilities and child welfare systems. A child's disability influences entry into child welfare care. Services for children with disabilities are under-resourced and underfunded. Gaps are interrelated and lead to family crisis. And finally, Manitoba has no law to govern children's disability services. The Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth has issued nine recommendations based on our findings from the report. We recognize that the previous 10 things you should know are problems in meeting the needs of children. And as a result, we made nine recommendations as we do in every special report we complete in order to improve the lives of Manitoban children. The recommendations include um, enact a new law to provide a continuum of supports and services for children with disabilities and their families that's in line with their rights. Develop a protocol with child welfare to coordinate services when needed. Fund a plan to reduce wait times for diagnostic assessments. Develop system navigation supports for families while on wait lists. Review and address case management caseloads. Improve accuracy of data about First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children. Gather regular feedback from children and families on services. Make a policies and procedures manual available to the public. And establish a full continuum of respite supports for families. Um, on this last recommendation, we're pleased to note the government has announced a pilot project partnering with St. Amant, focused on building overnight respite homes for children with disabilities in Winnipeg and Brandon. In their press release, they noted the launch of this program was, quote, adhering to a key recommendation in a report from the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth, end quote. We expect to receive a formal update from various government departments in 2022 with the activities they have started or completed to ensure substantive equality for children living with a disability in Manitoba. Thank you very much, Charlene and Whitney for that great presentation. Um, we do have time for questions and comments and observations now. And so if you wanna raise your hand on uh, the Zoom functions to ask your question out loud or type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, we can answer questions either way. Anyone have any pressing questions? Teresa Constance put something good in the chat that she wants she'd like to see a pilot program in the north for respite homes. I think that's an important comment. For sure. If you do have any questions or comments after the fact too. Um, we flip ahead to the next slide in our printer. We have all of our contact information up on there. So you can reach us through our website, manitobaadvocate.ca, or through the phone, 204-988-7440. We have a toll-free number as well, 1-800-263-7146. And an advocacy office in Winnipeg on Portage Avenue at 346 Portage, and another um, advocacy intake office in Thompson at City Center Mall. You can find us on social media at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handles are on the screen there. And if nobody has any questions, then I'm going to turn things back over to Cheryl. Um, oh, there's something in the chat there. Services are always offered in the South. There are a lot of children that need those services on reserves. 
how do we lobby for those services for federal lands? Good question. Brittany or Shannon, do you want to take that one? Charlene, I'll leave that to you given your research. Sure. Um, so uh, on federal lands, that is the jurisdiction of the federal government. So I think we're in our third webinar. Um, we're actually going to have two experts in Jordan's principal and have a lot of time for audience Q&A questions to really talk about real life questions about advocacy or um, instances where service providers have questions. Um, about sort of how to go about accessing services for kids they're helping specifically. So I'm not the expert in it, but I would really encourage you, Teresa, to join that one because there will be um, two special experts on that webinar that can really um, better answer those questions than, than you know, we would be able to. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, one of our experts for that webinar is the regional coordinator for Manitoba for Jordan's principal. So he will be well equipped to answer that question as well. So while we're talking about guest experts, um, we do have another webinar this uh, Wednesday with Dr. Richard Antonelli. I saw some questions earlier about um, case management and caseloads, um, and he is an international expert. Um, from Harvard, who speaks all over, including Canada, um, about uh, the coordination and integration of care for children uh, with disabilities and complex needs. Um, so he's also a great resource that uh, we can learn about in this important area on Wednesday. Good plug. <laughs> yes, that will be Joe uh, Gasseru. I, I don't want to mispronounce his last name, but he will be joining us on Wednesday. Uh, for someone's question in the chat there. There's another question in the chat box from Tanya. Is there anything being done to decrease caseloads for CDS caseworkers to ensure each family is able to get the supports they need? So that was a recommendation um, that we did make in our report um, to assess that. Um, I don't think our office has yet received anything formal about um, what work they're doing. Um, we generally give, um, when our office as practice uh, puts out a recommendation, we do leave a period of time, about a year at first, um, to get them before we ask for formal responses from the departments, which we uh, spread that to. Sometimes we get responses earlier, like the announced that we had at respite, um, but uh, we, we are not sure formally what um, government is doing to advance that one. We, we hope um, they're talking about it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, we're going to invite Cheryl back here to close us off in a good way with a prayer. Good afternoon. Miigwech gizi manatu. Iowe nama Iowanan mapa sama. Minawa nondawa munanan. Kita baganin gamon. Miigwech gia ikum. Mishumaseg minawa nokumaseg. Janago gia chik nomgom i Achig minawa wabang kiachik. Megwich manatu iachig nundanong iachig nabing iachig skotane minawa iachig akin. Megwich manatu iachig kiwetanong wabanong jawanong minawa espamok. Daga be we koden kawishin nag we mino pamatazia wingang. Megwich. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>